Well, thank you. Uh, thanks for that wonderful introduction. It was kind of weird to see those videos where uh, I got used to seeing my chin. I had, I, uh, as everyone knows, the uh, beard doesn't work with an N95 mask and being a frontline COVID worker this past year, I got to see my chin for the first time since I was age 15. Um, it's a relevant point because we've all had to make a lot of changes because of the pandemic. And I think it's a, a, a wise idea that if we're going to talk about any aspect of uh, healthcare during a pandemic, we ought to include the pandemic. So you'll note that my slides are a little different than uh, the things I've talked about in the past, because I do want to include um, the, the very uh, interesting aspects of COVID-19, uh, the risk factors for having a bad outcome and how they relate to nutrition. So uh, thanks so much again for having me and uh, we'll go ahead and get started. So starting out with the uh, pandemic, it's interesting that I used to start my, my talks with a, a picture of the Spanish flu epidemic uh, for, from 1918, because that was the time that for the first time or the last time that uh, heart disease was not the number one killer of Americans. It turns out that uh, it's, uh, we thought that COVID-19 would take it out in 2020, but the most recent analysis says that heart disease was still number one in 2020. Uh, so we're really in a syndemic or a dual pandemic, however you want to call it. And what we found interesting, you notice that this is a um, publication from the CDC in July. Uh, so sort of three months, four months into uh, the horrific uh, effects of, you know, when we were really stretched in every which way, trying to find ways of taking care of these sick people. Uh, and we're a lot better than we are, than we were back then. You don't have big cities with uh, ventilator, ventilator patients with a mortality rate of 80%, but things, things are better, but they're still pretty bad. As it turns out, um, very quickly, it was uh, apparent that the people who were getting in trouble with COVID were the people who had the risk factors that affect heart disease. So every cardiologist had to take a, a good hard look at this. Um, we've been managing you know, coronary atherosclerosis and uh, dealing with diabetes and obesity and uh, high blood pressure and high cholesterol for decades. And um, never was it more acute than when we had a second set of illnesses there where people die because they have those so-called comorbidities. And of course, um, in a year where social justice and um, ethnic disparities uh, were really at the forefront and uh, everything from the you know, issues of the policing and um, black on black crime, blue on black crime, we throw this, uh, this issue of people of color having a worse outcome with the coronavirus. And it was very apparent to us at Rush, um, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Rush University, it was actually built, the big hospital was built with the idea that we would take care of a disaster if it would happen. I mean, there's huge water tanks in case the water supply is contaminated. Um, have the capacity to take a, an in, you know, a colonoscopy suite, for example, and turn it into an intensive care unit in two hours. Uh, by the time we finished surging up all of our ICU capabilities, we had 175 ICU beds, which was you know, one quarter of the ICU beds in um, Illinois. And we ended up taking a taking care of a full one-fifth of hospitalized patients. There's 40 hospitals in the Chicagoland area, and we ended up with one-fifth of those patients. And when we looked at the data from an academic point of view, yes, we saw this uh, huge disparity that was reported in New York first and then uh, New Orleans. Everywhere where there are uh, folks of color, you saw an increased mortality rate. And, it, and the interesting part of that is that it became very clear that this doubling of the mortality rate, uh, one ethnicity versus another, was really related not just to ethnicity, but the risk factors that go along with that ethnicity. And if, uh, this is a slide that you might recognize from PCRM. It came out, look at the date on that. It's almost a month into it, realizing that uh, please do something to fix your diet because if you have uh, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol, you are going to be in trouble with this. And this was very predictive, very true. Um, and then the publication started coming out. 
So here you are uh, three months into it. And it's talking about if you get hospitalized, who dies? And it turns out that the black-white ratio in New Orleans was absolutely uh, quite high. Um, but I'm, what I'm showing you here is a Cox regression model where you take not just were, were they black or white, uh, did they live or die, but you actually look at as many risk factors as, uh, as you can. And as it turns out, the bottom line is this. Yes, 77% of the patients who were hospitalized with COVID uh, and 71% of those who died were African-American, even though it's only 31% of the population. And so the first part of that, catching COVID, really had to do with socioeconomic factors. If you are a frontline um, driving a bus as opposed to the CEO in a, in, uh, in a you know, office suite or being able to do your job from home, makes a huge difference uh, in terms of exposure. If you live in an area that's close to other people uh, and don't have the ability to spread out and uh, stay away from other folks in your family, uh, it can affect an entire family. And we saw that so many times. So, and then once hospitalized, um, who, who's gonna die and who's not gonna die? And that really depends on not so just race. And this, this is the whole point of this. And we saw the same thing at Rush. It's not just race, it's risk. And so after you, if you adjust for the socio-demographic factors and you adjust for the baseline risk factors, Black race doesn't increase your COVID. In fact, uh, their data said, you know, a hazard ratio of 0.79, that's like a 21% protection. Uh, ours was uh, 0.89, that's an 11% protection. And so it's very clear that we have social issues to deal with, but we also have to look uh, at ourselves uh, in the African-American community. What are we doing uh, to end up with all of the risk factors that make people die of COVID? Now, globalizing this just for a moment, uh, the, with this, the other pandemic that we were in, still very costly, still hanging around. Um, you know, what you may have heard is that it's lead, leading cause of death, cardiovascular disease leading cause of death around the world. But if you segregate it into low, middle income and high income countries, turns out that it's number one in all of the low and middle income countries but not in the high income countries, except the United States of America. It's the only high income country where um, it hasn't fallen below the rate of cancer. And then that last bullet, the fifth bullet, uh, going back to ethnicity, the fact that over 50% of men and women who are African-American have some form of cardiovascular disease, presenting later, presenting with more severity, having a 21% higher mortality rate. And so in cardiology, we really have, you know, bragged about um, how well we've been able to do. And if you, you know, you were listening to Dr. Khan and he was an interventional cardiologist and he looked at the effect of bare metal versus uh, uh, drug eluting stents and how much it helped us when people are having a heart attack, it's great. But the problem is that we weren't able to sustain that. And at 2015, the numbers started to go back up. And the black-white difference remained and the plateauing happened in all Americans, uh, black or white. And so we have to face the fact that as good as we've developed things in cardiology, at some point, the tremendous progress that we've made was going to be outstripped by our risk factors. And so we end up essentially mopping up the floor when we should be turning off the faucet. We can't say that enough. Yeah. Going to globalize it again for a moment because when you think about nutrition and heart disease, there was a landmark article that came out um, us a couple of years ago, looking specifically at what is happening around the world, the global burden of disease, and it's just tragic. 11 million people in 2017 losing losing their lives, and 255 million disability-adjusted life years attributed to diet, too much sodium, not enough whole grains not enough fruit. You put those kinds of, um, of associations together and say, we really could make a difference on this planet uh, and do a, remove a lot of suffering and death uh, if we could uh, impress on people the importance of, of quality nutrition. I want you to stare at this 
for a moment because I, I show this. It, it doesn't even have that much to do with my talk except peripherally. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to, uh, when you first look at it, but I'm going to link it in um, because uh, I often say that, you know, we have this financial chasm in the United States of America uh, where we're spending so much more on healthcare than the results would suggest. So this is life expectancy versus expenditure. And most of the expenditure uh, that we have is falling on the Medicare budget. And you know, the older people, it's in the last year, two years of life. And the results have really not um, been really, when you look at this, it looks like it's not worth it. That is, I, I know that extending someone's life is important to them, but why are we expending them, uh, extending it a year instead of another decade or another 15 years? And why can't we reach that? Don't we have the same technology of Japan or Spain? Uh, and why, why do we end up with such poor outcomes uh, with such high expense? And we really have to look inwardly. We have to look at our risk factors. Uh, it isn't, you know, when someone in, you know, France uh, or, or even Canada, as you know, has an, a medical problem, the place they want to be is the United States. <laughs> and with good reason, because we do have the best healthcare everywhere. So why, do, why are our outcomes so bad? It's our population, not our medical system. And so we have to really look inwardly and say, it's time for us to change. Uh, and I talk about this slide incessantly because I think everyone needs to become a, a, um, um, a, a witness for what it is that is going on here. We need everyone to contact your politicians, talk about nutrition, talk about uh, the kinds of programs that we saw you know, a couple administrations ago, and maybe they'll be coming back now, um, where people were supposed to you know, get up and move, and they were supposed to do more fruits and vegetables and get this kind of you know, public nudging going uh, because our whole system is supposed to cave in. Uh, and we were uh, scheduled in 2026 for Medicare to go broke. Now with COVID and all those expenditures, it's probably going to be um, more like 24, uh, 24. And in 2024, we're expecting that physician fees are gonna go down uh, by uh, 30%. That's not sustainable, except for the most loop, the most um, profitable systems. Our physicians and communities are not going to be able to tolerate that uh, at all. And so, what I'm hoping is that people will realize the importance of nutrition. Come to the kind of uh, talks like we're putting on here in this entire symposium, dedicated to righting this wrong. Uh, because if we don't, our, our medical system is going to cr to crash and we won't be able to keep up with these kind of financial expenditures uh, for very long. So I tell everybody it's their absolute pa patriotic duty, as well as to themselves, their families, their community, uh, to change the way we eat and get rid of these risk factors.